Great, I look better a long ways. Okay. So as I put in the ad before, this is my book, I Am the Author, How I Saved the Church, A True Story. And as part of my promotion, I'm going to read a few pages from it. This book is dedicated to, above all God, three persons in one. Thank you for calling me out among the many to lead the charge to save holy innocence. To my mom, dad, and brother, especially my mom, who endured my rigid phase of Catholicism and talks about Freemasons. Thank you for your many prayers and love. Teddy Barboza Thungrat Gachat. Thank you for being my best friend from church, my sidekick. Thank you for all your friendship, love, and support, because I couldn't have done it without you. Saving the Church, Preface. Young lady, you have no idea how the politics of the Catholic Church works. If the Cardinal says he's close to the Church, then he has already made up his mind. You're right, I have no clue how the Catholic Church works and her politics, but I do know how God works. In the end, he has the final say, not the cardinal. So it begins. Chapter 1. Out of darkness I was called. You are not ready to be married. That's it. I'm canceling the wedding. He was supposed to be the answer to my prayers. The man I loved and who loved me. My North African fiancé. On March 14, 2012, it was my father's 70th birthday. A day that will go down in infamy because my fiancé at the time called off the wedding. Our wedding day was supposed to be March 28, 2012. I was left in darkness and despair. My hope of love was gone. The only thing I had to cling to was my Catholic faith and my God. I was angry and so hurt that I was, that I was sick. I couldn't sleep. I turned on the TV and the color purple was on. The scene was when the father and daughter reconcile in the church and they are singing and dancing to God is trying to tell you something. God sure wasn't only trying to tell me something. He was telling me something. I just didn't know what yet. I felt deep pain because I was a jilted bride. My wedding dress was still in the closet and my engagement ring was still in the jewelry box next to my bed. I knew I had to move on. I knew my local archdiocese didn't have much to offer for someone like me, 30, single, need I say more? I decided to go across the river to the Catholic Young Adult Group in hopes of meeting new friends, maybe even someone new. I didn't know what to expect. I wanted to get involved with something bigger than myself. At the time, I didn't feel like going to daily mass was enough. I needed to be more involved. As time went on, I got more involved with this young adult group, and I eventually met a new friend who needed help with a young adult coffee hour at her church on West 37th Street. This was the door God was opening to save the Church of Holy Innocence. I started to attend the regular Sunday mass helping the priest and the girl I met at the other group with the coffee hour. I promoted it on social media, via emails, etc., but it never really built up. In fact, many people mistook me for the lady who ran the young adult coffee group and thought it was my group. I have a very big personality, very Jersey girl, bubbly, let's get this, let's get this thing done, funny and kind, yet I take no nonsense from anyone. Authoritative. Jealousy arose. Word had gone out that this was now my young adult group and I was trying to steal the spotlight from the other lady who honestly had no backbone whatsoever. So I stepped away from that church and group for about a month. I figured I would give it a break and let things calm down. Then I returned and started going to the Latin Mass. Little did I know this is where my troubles would truly begin. Chapter 2, I was called. There was a rumor. There was a rumor on that the Church of Holy Innocence was going to be closed. The parish was in a panic, yet nobody was willing to protect it. They were cowards and prayed for the church to close so they could be martyrs. 
and have something more to complain about. I heard from one of the lay directors that they would be a town hall meeting after mass and before coffee hour. The meeting was essentially him talking. When he asked if anyone had anything to add, I stood up and said, there is an online petition that I posted on change.org. The lay director spoke over me as if what I had to say wasn't important. Then another man stood up a tall, heavy-set man with white hair, and yelled at me, Young lady, you have no idea how the politics of the Catholic Church works. If the Cardinal has decided that he's closing the church, then he has already made up his mind. You're right. I don't know how the Catholic Church works, but I do know how God works. That was the shot that was heard around the world, because after that meeting, many of the people came to me and asked me for a link to the petition and how else they could help. Michelle, what's the name of the website? Should we actually get signatures? What if we don't have the internet or email? Yes, some of these people really live in the dark ages. I took care of all their questions. People began to sign the petition and our numbers grew. I used social media and email to spread the word. Countless times I would post on Facebook. We have over 3,000 signatures. You know the drill, sign, copy, paste, and share. One day I get a phone call, Michelle, so-and-so has made a professional YouTube video, a directive to help save the church. Please reset the petition, petition signatures because the numbers are about to skyrocket. This I did. The irony of it was I was told at the beginning that I didn't have a chance in hell of saving the church. The numbers did skyrocket. Yet every single Sunday, I had to endure the people at the coffee hour Oh, I am going to miss our church. I wonder if they will turn it into condos or a mosque. And plenty other insanities were mentioned. I did a lot of the physical work for this as well as much as the spiritual work. When I attended mass before the church was excuse me, when I attended mass before the church was saved from demolition. I would sit there after receiving Holy Communion and pray the rosary. I offered my communion up for the church I was in and its Mass, and I would visualize being able to go to Mass at the church for many more Sundays, Christmases, Easter's, and other such celebrations to come. As you know, it worked. Because there, is, there she is, still proudly stands on West 37th Street in New York City. The day came when it was time to deliver the petition to Cardinal. A group email was sent out. No one wanted to deliver it to the Cardinal's office. People had work and other obligations. Before I continue, I want to thank two people for combing the various petition sources, printing a beautiful off then placing the entire petition into beautiful binders so they were ready to present to the Cardinal, the sacristan and the office manager of the parish at the time, and my BFF and sidekick. Both of these men know who they are, so I said, I'll go and deliver the petition to the Cardinal. The petition had 5,777 supporters. When I left with it, when I left it with the Cardinal secretary, and in the bomb, I have put the link, www.change.org slash forward slash P forward slash his eminence, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, and keep the Church of Holy Innocence opened. And if you purchase a copy of this book, you can see the link. This is some of the pictures of the petition. Chapter 3. I have never. 
I've never met such a backward sort of people in my whole life. A cult obsessed with the conspiracy of the Freemasons and what happened back in 1962. At the time of the Second Vatican Council, mind you, most of these people weren't even born yet. Superstition and belief in a Catholicism that never existed. People more obsessed with how I look than what I ate. Michelle, stand on your head and pray all 15 decorate decades of the rosary and God will make you skinny. Seriously, it was that bad. Let's not forget the super secret masses at the house of the recently widowed Filipina lady because we have, a re we have the real religion and true form of Catholicism that Jesus started. However, we must keep it secret because the modernists, the priests, bishops, and popes won't understand. They'll shut us down. Talk about rude. How is this for a godly people? And yes, I believe God is love. Michelle, you're so fat and old, you should become a nun because you'll never find a man. Like, really? Who says that to people? During the ordeal of saving the church from closure, I dealt with such insane characters. A modern-day Sanhedrin, if you will. A people so obsessed with the aesthetics of the mass, their Catholic witchcraft, and so on. People who had made sex such a nasty thing that they didn't have sex inside a marriage or look for a spouse because they believed it was that evil. Closet homosexuals or asexuals, men who believe that the same sexual attraction is the worst sin ever, that they hide behind the cassock and surplus. They go on retreats to seminaries to discern. They have, they have been discerning for the last two decades. Yet at the age of four or older, they have never married, never been with a woman, never entered seminary, or even sent the application to start the process, or simply that they are asexual and not attracted to either gender. Never before in my life have I dealt with such a lunacy. This message of hate, not love. We're better than the rest of the world because we have Latin Mass. This is our God. However, there has been a lot of gossiping going on regarding the Pope. Some say he's a Freemason. Others suggest he's gay. And many more claim he may, be, he may have a mental disorder or simply be insane. Now I suppose I need to explain some of the craziness. First, let's, just, let's take a trip back to 1962. The Second Vatican Council ended their final session, and Pope Paul VI changed the Mass. The Mass of the Catholic Church went from being in Latin all around the world to being said in the vernacular of the people. A lot, of, a lot happened. Altars originally were built high up on the back uh, or front, excuse me, up on the back or front walls. They were torn down and replaced with tables. The Gregorian chant was replaced with Kumbaya and City of God. Latin Mass was essentially outlawed, with the, expect, with the exception of a few groups who broke off to preserve the Mass. Back in 2007, Pope Benedict declared it would be a, a legal Mass again, which many people believed and considered that's why he resigned. The Freemasons forced him out, I told you it was crazy. This created an insanity that, excuse me, this created an insanity that was the very essence of the mindset and spirituality as those who attended Holy Innocence. I can't even say it's spirituality. It's pure hate. They verbally crucify our current Pope, who if you ask me, is a really awesome Pope. By questioning his papal legitimacy since currently Pope Benedict the Sixteenth is still alive. They debate and argue among one another that Pope Francis is Petrus Romanus, Latin for Pope Peter the Second. In the prophecy of Saint Malachi, or Malachi, or Malachi, or Malachi, it, many different pronunciations of that, what was the anti-pope, the evil pope who would destroy Rome and God's Catholic Church. Though Saint Malachi is a legit saint by the Church. His prophecies aren't recognized because he was drunk at the time. Yet the people of Holy Innocence would rather follow the conspiracies, myths, and lies, and spread gossip. Gossipers are worse than thieves. Then follow fact. I could go on and on for chapters about this, 
to describe it in, a, in, in the complete details. I would need to write another thick book. What I'm about to write will seem like racism and bigotry. While this may be the case, it's not from my white German European side, but rather from my Italian Bohemian side, I honestly feel very bad for these women because they're the ones who are destroying the Catholic faith. They fully believe that all forms of the anti-Catholic conspiracy are pure gospel. They believe in modern day visionaries, seers, who have been discredited by Rome, but they rationalize that Satan is the Pope, so it's okay because this is real. They subscribe to these doomsday prophets and pay them for messages or newsletter subscriptions. These people for under such names as Maria Divine Mercy, she has nothing to do with St. Faustina, Dennis Leary, and other seers of Medjugorje. They have secret masses in their homes and bribe the priests with large amounts of cash to say these masses. According to church lore, you can't have mass in your home without permission from the bishop or the pastor of the local area. However, these women would have a Palatine father come in on his day off and he would say the mass, preach some sort of hate message, and then we would sit and eat down at the table after mass. You should become a nun because you're so fat. No man will want you. Michelle, do you like Filipino food? Yeah? Michelle, if you would drink bitter melon tea and alkalize, you, and alkalize your water, you wouldn't be so fat. Bitter melon is good for high blood sugar. I don't have high blood sugar. The St. Benedict medal is the only Catholic medal that has an exorcism and is actually mentioned in the old language of the Latin church. So I believe this metal has exorcism powers. I, unfortunately, I once had a boss who killed himself. And when I had spread the word to the people at the church, they said, it's your fault your boss killed himself because you didn't put St. Benedict medals in every corner of the building in which he, had, he worked as that's where he killed himself. Growing up European, this is, a, this is terribly uncivilized savage behavior. Never in my life have I seen a group of people so hateful, mean, bigoted, sexist, and nasty. These women talk more to God than their husbands. They all say the same thing, that they always want to be nuns, but their parents force them into, ma them into marriage. I have never seen such a group of people who hate themselves so much. The Filipinos the Filipinas don't marry their own. Not that I'm against interracial dating. My current boyfriend is biracial himself. Yet, once these women come to this country with their fake form of Catholicism, they don't stay with their own at all. They want to marry and breed with white European men. Honest to God, I have yet to see it. They prefer men of Italian and Jewish heritage. I have a belief, they, excuse me, they have a belief that marrying white men betters their race and class. Yet these women are so overbearing and verbally pick on their sons that the majority of Filipino men wind up being gay. They are so bizarre in what they believe that if any white American European man acted that, as they did, he would be labeled a racist. Such abnormalities in their men are also what I call asexualism, a lack of preference for either men or women. I know of this one Filipino man in his 30s. He said to me, my dad is on my case every day telling me to find a girlfriend and get married. My response was, okay, so what's the problem? I don't, I don't care. I don't want to date anybody. I have no interest in women or men. Are you discerning? No, I just don't care either way. I'm sorry, but it's abnormal for any healthy man in his 30s to say something like this. This is the case of all the Filipinos I know. I don't know if this is emasculation or what. Also, there are very few religious vocations for people from the Philippines, with mothers who are so zealously religious that you would think the church would have a surplus of Filipino priests, but they don't. Take this for example. I became somewhat of a spiritual mother to a young man. I, to a young man, 
I was invited to a gathering of sort of a farewell before he went off to minor seminary. I live in New Jersey and this young man lives in Queens. I crossed state lines and finally found parking, a miraculous feat in itself, as residents of Queens will agree. Then I get a phone call telling me, don't come up. I asked why. He told me so and so is here. And I asked, did you invite them? He told me that it was an open ended, so you need to go home. So I turned around and went back to Jersey. To cut a long story short, I saved this kid's life from seminary. He's openly gay, you see, and going into Catholic seminary or any sorts of religious institution, an openly gay individual is really frowned upon. He was regularly hazed and sexually harassed. I went to help him move out, and his uncle also helped. His mother didn't know how he was coming home until he knocked on the door. Remember, these are Filipinos. We get him home, and she reads him the riot act. Son, the next time you go to seminary, don't come home until you're a cardinal. I was left speechless. How could a mother say that to her son who was just tortured? This, this sort of behavior is not how Jesus wants us to act or behave. Chapter 4. Real short chapter. Chapter 4. The asexualism of the Catholic man. Not interested in women. Not interested in men. Indifferent to the priesthood. Indifferent to marriage. Try to be Catholic superheroes by evangelizing and staying celibate without vows. Many of the men mentioned were men in seminary and were rejected for good, bad, and indifferent. The day of deliverance. One second, I don't want to give too much away. Chapter 5, the day of deliverance. And that's it. I have about two more chapters left, but I don't want to give the whole thing away. Because then there's no point of purchasing the book if I read you the whole thing. So that's my story, Morning Glories. Okay? So I am going to post the link yet again in the comments. How I Saved the Church. A True Story. Isn't it a fabulous color? This is my pride and joy, and I'm currently working on another book as well. So, hope you enjoyed the story. Hope you enjoyed this video. God bless you. Um, when As soon as it's posted, I'm going to post the Amazon link. Um, it's available on Amazon. And I think it's like $5.38. It's really cheap. Like, a cup of coffee costs more. So, um... I'm looking forward to getting a lot of orders from you guys. So take care, okay? God bless. Bye-bye.